Hello and welcome to Music Industry 360 Podcast. I'm Randall Foster. I'm the Chief Creative Officer at Symphonic, and I am happy to be here hosting our, our great friends from Key Change US. With me today, we have Andrea De Silva, and she's going to talk to us about Key Change and all of the incredible things they're doing, um, as well as how that kind of interfaces with International Women's Day. And uh, and hopefully we'll all learn something today and know more about that organization and find out ways we can all help too. Andrea, welcome. Thank you, Randall. It's great to be here. And we're big fans of the work that Symphonic Distribution is doing. Thank you so much. So can you tell us about Key Change, um, you know, the origins? I know this something that started overseas and and and, and is taking root here and gaining steam here in the U.S. Um, give us give us the 10,000 foot view on what Key Change is. Absolutely. So Key Change is a movement and it started in Europe back in 2017, was founded by Vanessa Reed, who at the time was the CEO of the PRS Foundation out of London. And today uh, the PRS Foundation remains one of our three core partners in Europe along with Music Center of Us out of Stockholm, Sweden and the Rieberbahn Festival, which is based in Hamburg, Germany. And they provide leadership and uh, wanted to really look at global expansion. So they've, they've been moving into other parts of the world, not only the United States. And last summer, they decided to expand into the U.S. market in, in earnest. And we, we had a launch event in New York City on June 14th. And really, we've just been building from the startup, like, you know, from the ground up, like any startup, building all the building blocks to eventually go live and go public with our activities and events, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. And the idea being to really achieve gender equality for women and gender expansive individuals across the music ecosystem. So... I say ecosystem because we know it's not just the music industry, even though in the U.S. we talk a lot about business and industry. And in contrast, in Europe, maybe sometimes there's more of a conversation or culture. So, you know, on the one hand, as a movement, it has a little bit of an activist flavor to it in that you're building from the ground up with the people that are on the ground, a.k.a. artists, musicians, and so forth. Um, on the other hand, it takes, uh, you know, all ships, if you will, all tides to rise. And uh, it's also an effort that involves governments, policies, and the corporations and the trade associations and just all facets. So you have community and you have industry and you have government all together. Very interesting. So... Um, you named a few of these, who are the other stakeholders that we're, that we're really targeting with their activities? And can we talk about the, the main overarching goal? You used a phrase that I'm very, I'm very curious about gender expansive. And I, I would love to have you expound a little bit upon that and, um, and help us all understand a little bit more what that means. Absolutely. So, you know, a lot of the international bodies like the United Nations, had focused many initiatives on young girls and women. And as the decades wore on, there was a realization that a part of the population was missing. And we're deliberately using the term gender expansive rather than maybe refer to minorities because we're looking at the non-binary. So a lot of the research that was coming out of the UN, for example, was really based on and focused on quote unquote, straight or binary women. And so now the term is used to really be more inclusive and to be more diverse for women that are queer, non-binary, to kind of encompass the whole field of intersectionality for transgendered and so forth. So there's an inclusivity there for women and others that identify with any category. Uh, of female, if you will, but may not be on that binary uh, spectrum, for lack of a better word. And the other thing I would say about it is language really matters. And this is perhaps where, you know, a lot of our education will come into bear over time as we build 
brand name recognition in the United States for people to understand that if you're really going after real DEI, diversity, inclusion, and equity, you have to consider all the different flavors and facets of, of humanity. There's not just one type of woman or female uh, that is participating in the workforce or in the artistic community. No, absolutely. And it's, I mean, even personally, I, I, I have gone through a transformation in the way I view the titles and the things that we use with our pronouns um, really unilaterally you know, over the, over the past few years. And it, it is, uh, you're right. It's an education and, it, and it's, something- I agree. Yeah. The, the topic of pronouns, uh, it's, it, I wouldn't say that I just, you know, elegantly, you know, started to use a, an accurate pronouns. I have stumbled quite a bit and I still do, uh, because it's not only with language, but there's a visual perception when you see another person, you associate uh, a gender or an identity with them. And today we're trying to be broader in our thinking and therefore much more inclusive so that people are self-identifying and you know they're claiming the identity that they most associate or identify with. And it's definitely a sign of respect to be curious about people's pronouns and, uh, you know, where they feel they fit in the world and it's no longer just one you know it's not uh it's not binary it's a multitude of identities and it's it's beautiful it's really that the rainbow of the human experience and i love that people can identify themselves in numerous ways and for some people they don't want to have a pronoun and that's fine too but the idea being, uh, it's, you know, identity, gender identity is, is pretty complex. And so let's be respectful of how people identify and also allow them to be in the space where they do identify. Absolutely. Well, and, and identifying is only part of the goal there. Then, then, you know, diving a little deeper into the organization, you know, we're looking you, we collectively are looking for for parity and and for for even playing ground. Uh, you know, that's right. Right. I think that's I think it's a beautiful cause and a beautiful a beautiful uh, thing to, to to work towards. Um, so as you're as you're working towards these goals and trying to service these stakeholders, um, can you tell us a little bit about the role that data plays? in the conversation around gender equity? Um, for instance, where are you sourcing your data and how are you deploying that into the organization and the industry at large to serve the greater good and to serve your mission? You know, this is a really good and important question. Uh, I was I was in the federal government previously and data was like the lifeblood because with data, you can kind of prove a point or at least get closer to convincing people that, you know, your point needs to be addressed because the data supports it. And it's no different with gender equity. And I think once uh, we started measuring the state of play for women in music, some of the data was just downright shocking or appalling considering the fact that women, um, inclusive of gender expansive individuals, constitute at least 50% of the population worldwide. And uh, the Annenberg Inclusive Study, Inclusion Study, which is one of the sources that we've gone to, for example, found that only 2.8% of producers were women. And another way to look at that is, uh, so where where are the, you know, what's going on there? Uh, that means there's 90 seven and a half percent of the industry are men it's a, you know it's a very domineering number to think about and then what does that mean for women that might be interested in you know the stem industries when their kids going to to school to study but they suddenly see the whole industry is so you know male focused what they see is is men 
And it's hard for them to relate to that or to feel like, well, this is something I could do. It becomes aspirational, but it seems almost unattainable. Looking at other types of, of uh, research, our founding donor, uh, Tunecor and their parent company, Lead, they have annually, uh, now going on three years, created a market research piece called um, Be the Change. And they came, you know, they went in and found very similar information. And so we know that it's, you know, it's not only one source to find data, there are many, but sometimes the industry really has to step up and uh, be accountable themselves and create the opportunity to do the research because it seems very esoteric to some to say, yes, we're a movement on gender equity in music. And people will say, well, why just music? Isn't this a question, you know, for all industries? Yes, it is. But here we go. We know that in some aspects of music, songwriters, uh, producers, like I said, there is still a relatively very low or extremely low participation of women and gender expansive individuals. And if you couple that with the fact that women are earning maybe 72 cents to the dollar of men, and you start to look at kind of the stereotypes and how people think about STEM education and the career opportunities therein, you start to realize that there are all these barriers out there. Not only that, but there's questions around, you know, women when they come up in leadership roles, do they have an opportunity to work in industries that may be heavily influenced by uh, male employment, um, they might suffer from what's known as imposter syndrome in that they're afraid to kind of advance in their career. They don't feel that they have a place because they're not identifying with the other individuals that are in that space or they feel intimidated. And sometimes it gets much worse than that. You know, sometimes just kind of taking a little bit of leap here in this thought process around what we know about gender equity in the music sector, um, especially for younger artists going into a recording studio. If, if you're a young woman or gender expansive person, it can be pretty intimidating if your recording session is at 9 p.m., it's nighttime, you're all alone in a studio, and basically everyone working there is a male. And, you know, you have to kind of figure out, do I feel safe and, you know, what's going on? And it it, it just seems like things uh, could appear to be stacked up against women and not for lack of women wanting to participate or be in those leadership roles or be in those more engineering, scientific or tech related roles. It's kind of how things came to be. And then by association, that's seen as well, that's just how it is. That's the industry standard. There aren't enough women, you know, in these roles or there. So we should all just accept it. But then research found that, well, in fact, there's a lot of women that are interested in being engineers and working in the field, but that glass ceiling sure is hard to blast through. So really, you know, tying it back to the goals that, that we have and what our cohorts in Europe have been working on for five years is to really challenge the stereotypes to you know get the data to uh, build allies and especially with men uh, without a question so crucial to have allyship with men who one understand and respect the challenges that many women and gender expansive individuals face in music but that they're more inclusive in their behavior and their actions and an example there that i might mention is you know, so often uh, in, in my tenure working with the music industry, when I've gone off to a conference, it's it's all male speakers on the panels or a majority or a dominance of, of men. And I always ask myself, well, where are the women? I know there are female executives in this space that are knowledgeable on this topic. And a lot of the men would say, well, they, you know, there aren't that many women in this space. And it's not true. And, you know, you can go into so many reasons for what, where were the women or where are the women or why are they included. But my point tying to allyship is, hey, dear friend, Joe, let's just say a random name. When you're invited to speak at that next panel at 
XYZ major music industry conference, why don't you ask how many women and gender expansive individuals are also speaking on the panel? Or ask if you can invite a woman or gender expansive individual that you know. And and really kind of put the the event on notice with we'd like to see a level playing field. It's not to challenge them, but just to kind of say, well, if half the world is includes women with including gender expansive individuals because not every woman is straight um why aren't they also here with me doing this work and not assume that they don't want to be or no nah, they're not working now because they had kids or no nah, they don't really come out much they like to stay in the office you know there's so many wrong stereotypes no absolutely what happened? yeah sorry go ahead I was gonna. I was gonna say. I'm. I'm experiencing that myself right now. Um, for 15 years now, I've been producing events for the Nashville Film Festival, and and I have witnessed the shift in dynamic and, and the shift in just in just need. <laughs> like let let's be representative of the community that we're that we're talking to. Um, and even as as early as last week, I submitted myself for a panel at an upcoming conference, and I, you know, it was definitely part of my thought process in there um was was the idea of okay this is great we need experts to be a part of this but this has got to be a diverse panel because because it, it's got to it's got to reflect that of what the audience is and the truthful matter is it, i'm heading out to south by southwest the audience of south by southwest is not all men <laughs> nor is nor is it not all white cis men and so um and so it is a, a good friend of mine said to me at one point um, when we were having a discussion about diversity um, with regards to a, a, a board of directors at that time, he said, and I, I'll never forget it, and I, and I utilize it probably weekly, but diversity has to be intentional. It That's ha right. has to be. You have, it, eventually, it'll become second nature where it won't be intentional. But until it is, it has to be intentional because otherwise the status quo is all we're left with. And I think I just I, I think what you, what you all are doing is so fantastic to to keep that to keep that discussion alive and to push that that discussion not only into the you know into the events and panels and and conferences we have but also to talk directly to corporations about ways they can deploy these things. I would love it if you could talk a little bit about the key change three pillars. And, and what they stand for and how, yeah. Yeah. how they integrate into not only the message, but action items that are takeaways for everyone who who intersects with your organization. Thank you. Yeah, I'll preface that by saying uh, I'm in awe of what they've accomplished in Europe in these past five years. And uh, our partners there just released a uh, new uh, pledge action plan. I'll tell you about the pledge in a moment, uh, where they're kind of taking a new tack in how they're approaching it. And a lot of it is really based on what you were saying uh, in being intentional and finding, you know, the right allies. And I think, you know, maybe challenging the systems a little bit as you go along, but Key change is built on three pillars, and one of them is a global key change pledge. The other is a talent development program, and the third is a manifesto. And I'll start with the manifesto. So after uh, key change was formed in Europe, they realized that they really need uh, government assistance and intervention. And so they went to Brussels with a manifesto basically saying, we see the work here as being a combination of education, you know, activism, if you will, funding and policy, you know, looking at what are policies that are supporting or preventing women and gender expansive individuals from getting ahead and what, you know, what kind of language is, is out there. And so the manifesto is really, uh, it's, it's a little bit like a mission statement, but it's really just to identify how, as an organization, we can engage a diverse set of stakeholders who accomplish the goal because it, one organization alone can't do it. 
And it certainly can't happen without funding. And so as a result, uh, Creative Europe, uh, which is the division of the European Union that funds these types of sectors, uh, eventually did award uh, some some good monies to the European key team to do their work. It's a competitive application and process. It's not just handed to them. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of good things came out of that manifesto of, of really being very intentional and very focused on what makes change. And then there's the Global Key Change Pledge. And one of the findings that our European cohorts had discovered after five years of having a pledge, the pledge is an organization basically agrees to really focus on uh, diversity and inclusion and being more gender expansive. So let's say you're an orchestra, you want to make sure that your principal player is a woman or a gender expansive person, that it's not only men and not only white men. If you're a festival, you want to make sure that your lineup consists of women and gender expansive bands. And not only that, but the musical works that are being performed on stage are also written and or produced by women and gender expansive individuals. When you start going down that list, you realize, you know, like, gosh, yeah, this is a pretty male-dominated field. And then you keep those similarly to trade associations, to large businesses and nonprofits, small businesses, and ask, so what is the composition of your staff since you're working in the music biz? Is it all white men or 90%? Could you maybe look to have more women and similarly um, your board members? And that your board members aren't only uh, all white men, women, as you look to diversify, they are gender expansive. And because race is so intrinsically tied to this conversation around DEI and inclusion, that they're not just women of color, but also, I'm sorry, not just white women, but you're really representing the true diversity. So are they black, Latino, Asian, and so forth? And it takes a lot of intention. You know, if you're um, hiring an executive search firm to do the job search for an executive, um, are you mandating that they bring you a diverse set of applicants? You know, it could be something where you just start there. And I know everyone says, well, we just want the best candidate. And oftentimes that best candidate is going to be a diverse person compared to uh, a white middle-aged man just to, he's kind of a stereotypical face of things but that person may not have had access to the information for the various reasons that they've been discriminated against previously or they've just kind of withdrawn from submitting themselves as a candidate because haven't seen anyone else in their likeness and didn't necessarily feel that they have a place so there has to be a lot of intention around it and what um, our partners uh, in Europe have found when they researched the impact of this pledge over five years was for the organizations that just made a statement, you know, put a stake in the ground, we are going to pledge to more, to be more inclusive. We're going to pledge for gender equity. It wasn't even a year and they suddenly had at least 60% female speakers, including some cases, gender expansive individuals at their conferences and their events and performers and, and even, you know, their hiring practices changed and it's kind of a snowball effect, but it really starts with that intentionality. The third pillar of key change, so it's the manifesto and key change pledge for gender equity and the key change pledge, just to conclude, it's free, it's open to anyone that's an organization, a company, a nonprofit. A trade association, a festival, uh, you know, um, music managers, people that are really working in this industry, if you will. It's not just, it's not for individuals per se. Um, and we will work with that entity to design a key change pledge that's authentic to their organization and their mission. And then we provide support for them to achieve certain metrics. And we do ask for metrics and it, it's, it becomes a very organic activity. And there's more than 600 organizations, uh, I think 614 at the last tally, 
that have signed, and we have several coming up in the U.S. that are signing up as we have begun our, you know, outreach and expansion efforts across the United States. So we're pretty excited about that. The last part is our talent development program. And the talent development program is really interesting. In Europe, they have 74 talent that go through a year-long program. We're uh, hoping to launch our, all of our activities soon, including the talent development program with 25 artists and innovators. So it'll be half artists, musicians, performers, and the other half, the innovators, which will be music professionals, it could be a lawyer, it could be someone who's formed a nonprofit or a kind of a, a program that's working towards music or gender equity related topics. Um, a music manager, an A&R, I mean, really the spectrum, or someone who's created something, an app maybe, or built a product or a service. It has to be kind of considered an innovator. So this talent development program that we're going to launch in the U.S. will go for seven months, and we'll have a handful of festival and conference partners that sign up for us so that the artists can perform at their festivals and then the uh, innovators will speak at their conferences. And we have a, a baked in mentorship program, which will really speak to everything from confidence building to fighting imposter syndrome to, you know, PR skills and how to go global or how to, you know, build the best website and get the most attention to artist manager relationships and why it's important to have good relationships and you know the do's and the don'ts so really just a to c of being a professional and the target will it won't be individuals that are right out of school it'll be someone who might have gotten a little peer recognition they might have a management team in place but they haven't gone super big really an emerging artist and an emerging innovator and I think that's how we uh, here at the U.S. will start to really build very authentically from the ground up and tap into, I hope, a very diverse set of professionals. For our purposes, they'll have to be uh, a U.S. citizen. I, I don't know if we've looked into whether they could be a green card holder or not, but if you're Canadian, for example, you wouldn't be able to apply, uh, at least not in this year. Um, actually, Canadians can apply through the European key change um, talent development program as an aside. So if somebody wanted to participate in that, how would they apply? We are going to launch an open call. So the application and we're, we're aiming for about a week after South by Southwest. And as soon as we're ready, we're going to have all that branding and promotion out there and people can follow us at our website, which is w.keychangeus, one word. Dot com, and then on our Instagram handle, the same keep you know at keep change us, um, and you'll recognize the logo uh, for those who might be listening and not watching. You know, black background, with light light pink <laughs> logo and name. Um, so, and we'll share that with you with some phonics so you could share it with your your cohorts. And yeah, there'll be you know a lot of more a lot more information parameters around who can apply and what the conditions are. Right? We want to manage expectations, so we create a program that's going to be fun and, and innovative and, you know, challenging as well. And, you know, doing some of that hard work through the mentorship because you, you pick up issues that, you know, people can be triggered by, by going into negative experiences that they've had in, in this industry or even you know, with their younger years. And it comes up when you sit down and really reflect on it. So it really should be a, a holistic and, you know, one-stop shop type of a program. We're even going to provide childcare, which we think we could be one of the first in the, in the music biz to offer childcare in connection with an educational program in music. We may not be, but I think we might be at least a forerunner. I've certainly never heard of it. <laughs> yeah so you you guys you all covered some incredible ground in five years in the international operation that's that's yeah that's an awful lot um I, i'd love to hear about you know you've got your the the 2023 action plan with your five after your five years of work 
Um, and there's some results from that. Um, you- yeah, I have to say, so I don't, I'm sorry. I don't have that particular uh, plan in front of me, but I could tell you just a little bit about it. That, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, the the one of the biggest things that came out of it, which seems so obvious, is that measuring impacts lead to change, leads to change. So like I was saying, when um, Key Change had an organization sign the pledge, it seemed like they pretty quickly were able to scale up to have more women on their stages and gender expansive individuals and the same on, you know, the conferences and panels because it's like they put themselves on notice to really focus in on this. But only once they were really, um, you know, focused on measuring the impact did they see that team before, you know, an organization might say, yeah, we're very gender diverse and, you know, but we're all white. Well, then, you know, you haven't quite arrived yet because you're essentially catering to one aspect of population. So um, in the report, which uh, I don't think we've linked to our website yet, but it could be found on the w.keychange.eu website. Um, and we likely will be including links to all of these things for our listeners out there um, to explore further from our blog once once this is up. So, yeah. Um, so that's the 2023 Key Change uh, Action Plan, Pledge Action Plan. And the four main points are beyond gender, urgent action, global community, and education and activism for the future. And what is beyond gender? I mean, obviously, that is to be much more inclusive for gender expansive individuals so that intersectionality is truly addressed. And you're not just getting, quote unquote, straight women, but more so that you're also understanding how uh, being a black female or a non-binary artist or Asian or Latina or, you know, you can go down the list is going to really change your experience working in the industry. So Keith Dave has come to understand that the pledge has to look beyond gender to race and other factors that people are discriminated on uh, the basis of, and that could include uh, race, like I mentioned, it could include age, it could include disabilities. So, you know, so oftentimes able-bodied individuals are prioritized in uh, ahead of, of people that have disabilities. And it could be any kind of disability. Uh, you know, it could be uh, a visual, uh, a physical impairment, even irritable bowel syndrome is included in in that accounting because it can be so disruptive for an individual that has to tour, travel, be on stage and, you know, to kind of stabilize the situation and they can lose out on opportunities because they just, you know, this long time frame that modifications can be done to support them. And urgent action, that really speaks for itself. Like, it's yesterday, it has to happen now global community really building the community authentically from the ground up worldwide it can't just be that the europeans are focused on it and they're holding hands and singing kumbaya but that there's a real earnest extension to the whole world and especially in you know what we would say or call the global south you know developing economies where uh conditions are must, much less advantageous in general for musicians and people in the music industry to really focus because there, you know, could be fewer or much weaker laws of the book protecting women and gender expansive individuals and which is so much work that needs to be done. Um, and then education and activism for the future, meaning that the education that's the efforts that are putting place, including, for example, our talent development program, is considering, well, what's what's going to happen um, in the next five to ten years, right? Are prevailing attitudes going to change? Uh, how will, you know, religious views perhaps impact 
uh, the work that we're trying to do and how does key change need to be aware of and sensitive to that? Um, how can we really be more activist uh, maybe than we are? So again, I'm I I'm not an expert on the action plan. You'd have to bring the European crew in, but I think it's safe to say um, their finding is that more work needs to be done. And I think we all feel that. And I think we also all know, um, maybe it's obvious, but it's good to state it, that, the, you know, the situation where uh, women and gender expansive individuals are denied access or or put down or limited or omitted from the conversation is not unique to the music industry. It, it happens across so many industries. And so it, it really is a call to global action you know, just continuing the work of so many great organizations. Um, with that said, I should just put a nod, you know, not only to the Europeans, I can't take credit for what they're doing, but, you know, I've been here trying to help build and expand in the United States. There are also so many sister organizations in place already that are also working on gender equity in the space of music in, in different ways. You know, some are focused more on diversity and race matters, and bringing more black people to the stages. Some are focused more on making sure that young girls and women are getting uh, STEM education and that they're being funded and that they're encouraged to continue through and fight those barriers. Some are, are working to help more women you know, I'll believe that you too can be an engineer and, you know, we'll help you kind of get ahead. And, um, you know, I can go down the list. It's, it's, it's a lot of people. And I think it's really coming to light now. People's awareness is shifting. Um, people, um, well, what can I say? You know, there were a few things that happened. It was the hashtag Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter movement that really uh, expedited the call. But, you know, feminists have been out there talking this talk for five, six decades and going back in history. But really, you know, the inequities have just come so to the forefront and with social media and the way the world is globalized and global communication is available 24 seven, I think it's just really all come to a head and it's, it's impossible to just sweep the problems and and the disruptions under uh, the discrimination under the rug and we're just having to address it and of course you know the if i could say it that way you know the grammys were put on notice basically you know the the film industry too where many people were calling for you know a more diverse host to host the, the award shows and, you know, what's up with only white people or majority white people receiving the awards and to really do a more of a, an earnest scrutiny and accounting on, well, you know, what else is out there? And maybe that questions, you know, prevailing stereotypes. I think it questions a lot of things, our educational system and just each one of us has to check ourselves and, you know, Am I making a determination about you, Randall, the second the camera went on and I saw you about your identity and who you Good God, I hope not. <laughs> is that, you know, if that's how we were taught, you know, it's just like an assumption, right? Uh, or, you know, are, are we curious and we're waiting, you know, to know more about the individual, but not also not judging them on, not judging people on appearance or, you know, where they're coming from and, especially before knowing but also you know in my heart i hope there's a world in which these things won't have to be highlighted and called out i i hope that i'll work myself out of a job uh as a white woman not because i'm ashamed of of that heritage uh but because i know there's someone else out there equally deserving who'll be fantastic in this job and I'll really be celebrating when I see as much diversity as possible that's reflecting the world we live in. And it's really about that is, is just celebrating diversity and showcasing um, 
you know, who we are as a planet and, and the diversity that we already are, it's there. And not discriminating about against people. It's hard to imagine that we're still so discriminatory in our attitudes and behavior, but we are. The, the, the neat thing that I take away from this, from hearing you speak, is that you speak a lot of the future. And you've called out the past a little bit here, but the focus is on the future. I, I was there at Madison Square Garden when the when the wheels fell off the Grammys <laughs> in the cringiest, most tone deaf commentary I've ever heard from the stage. And and that change happened and it's I think getting better. I think it's not perfect yet, but you know, Sam Smith and Kim Petras performing at the Grammys this year. Um yeah. was was gender expansive in, in its nature. Um I think a lot of these other organizations, other and other folks in the industry you know, Black Lives Matter, et cetera. Um, you know, there there is a reaction to all of that that is moving everybody in the right direction. And so the future and the fact that the future is so much a part of your manifesto and what you all are doing, I think is so awesome because we spend a lot of time in this industry breaking our arms, patting ourselves on the back for our past accomplishments. Um, and it's nice to look forward. I wonder, as we look forward towards the future, um, can you just quickly point to some of what you view to be the biggest challenges for the industry, for your organization? And, and also, I, fi I always find in my life that in challenge comes opportunity. And so, um, you know, what opportunities are out there beyond that of which we've already talked about here? Because I think I, I think that that's a really in incredible way for us to, to, to kind of focus on the future and, and what the role your organization plays in it. Thank you. Yeah. And again, I mean, I cannot take the credit. It, it really all goes to those that have come before me and with key change in Europe and all the many individuals and organizations, because, you know, it's not only the, the individuals that are representing those core partners and the people who designed the program at the outset. And there's so many names and organizations that I couldn't even list them all. But it's also their partners, the festivals across Europe and the conferences, and then by extension, you know, in Canada as well. And, you you know, you just, it's wonderful to be in their presence and, you know, feel that there's this progressive thing happening. And now we want to see this getting bigger and better in the United States. Some of the challenges are um, talking to men and men becoming very defensive or kind of disassociating them from the co the conversation because they feel it doesn't apply to them and you know to to be clear that this is um this isn't uh a dismissal of men or middle-aged white men by any chance you know there's an incredible knowledge base and experience out there it's more a request to, hey, can we have a conversation and try to level the playing field so that more women and gender expansive individuals also share that opportunity. And it's hard to, you know, talk about things like entitlement and it's hard to talk about racism. And especially as a white person to go, I, I can't really make any claims. Um, I think the challenges are to really get everybody on board um, in a fashion where people start to feel that uh, they want to see change and it matters to them. And maybe even for some, if all they're thinking about is the bottom line, that they could see, hey, even, you know, a lot of research out there shows when an organization is led by women or managed by women, uh, you're you're getting higher employee satisfaction people stay in the jobs longer and there's oftentimes uh more of a sense of community and belonging and you know the reasons why that's its own research study but a lot of research has shown that organizations that are led by women are actually earning more money the bottom line is is uh affected so, you know, there's something there, there, I think in a perfect world, you know, we'll have a good blend of everything. 
uh, and, you know, instead of ultimately having to focus so, so much on this topic. So talent is, you know, having conversations where people aren't offended or dismissive or just disassociate themselves completely and to really kind of reach across the aisle. And, and by the way, it's not just some, you know, men sometimes feel those things, women too. Sometimes women cannot relate to this conversation because it's uh, it's just too challenging or it's too foreign because their whole culture and environment has it all about you know being the woman whatever that means, but not necessarily you know having to kind of stand up for it or stand up against uh, a larger machine. Uh, the opportunities ahead are really for, you know, I, I, in my prior role, you know, I saw this as very important. You have to include everybody, civil society, the nonprofits, people that are at the ground doing the work, people in government, local government, federal government, and the current administration did establish the first ever gender policy uh, office or, or division. So that's pretty powerful, the work that they're doing right now. I'll be curious to see, you know, as the reports come out from their work. And engaging the government uh, for the role that they have in, in helping society move forward, you know, building roads, uh, expanding, you know, education, healthcare, areas where government can be effective, not where government might be seen as a burden on the system. And um, of course, industry, right? Our innovators and business and, and people that are, you know, going global and thinking globally and innovating, um, and also that they can bring money to the cause because you need money to get things done as well, and uh, for everyone to really work together. And so the opportunities are for a lot of our sister organizations to band together. And, you know, I'm a big fan of, well, you know, maybe you don't want to just hit your head against the wall. Maybe you just want to do your own thing. So maybe we'll build a new system or maybe we'll build um, new alliances and new entities, organizations and events. Um, it kind of remains to be seen. I think we're, there are some people's minds we're not going to change. And there are some people who are, are not going to want to have any part of this conversation. But I say, you know, at the end of the day, when you go home to your family or your life, are, are you only covering with people that look like and sound like you? Or is, is that world pretty diverse from beginning to end? You know, where you shop, where you eat, where you sleep, where you work. And let's, let's just look at really leveling that playing field. And I think there's a real big role for continued market research and data gathering to show, you know, where the deepest challenges are and to bring the data, bring the data to policymakers, you know, people that are really good at analyzing gender equity and DEI data to understand what's happening, why is it happening, and therefore what are some of the recommendations to improve it. And so Keychain US and Keychain out of Europe's answer to what are some of the ways to improve it is to really help the talent evolve and develop and break through the glass ceiling, but also feel really solid in their place in the world as an artist or an innovator. And then as future citizens that go on to do great things, but also to give back and to, you know, address governments in terms of what policy and equity work is important to be done and to address industry, uh, not only in terms of, of funding, but also are you hiring you know, for, for the future? And are you really responding to the real needs and not just thinking about bringing your friends and the people that look like you into the fold? And I think, you know, the, the beautiful thing about the music industry is this it is part of the creative economy. Music gives so much to people. And when people start to reflect on what music means to them daily and in their lives and how they can associate events with the song or vice versa, or think about what you were doing in the pandemic. Maybe it wasn't music, maybe it was video games, but 
you know, everyone has some very strong associations with music. This is this is a field that really matters, and and we want to make sure that you know the the other half of the population are also being seen and heard and respected and invited naturally into the conversation to the point where we can you know in a very idealistic world vision reach that balance and you know also work ourselves out of a mission i guess that's my hope well and and it's a noble cause you all are, are are championing my computer is unplugged and about to die. So um, that, and we are at the pretty much the end of our, our normal podcast time here. So I want to thank you for everything you do, for everything your organization does. Everyone, this is Andrea De Silva from Key Change US here joining us on the Music Industry 360 podcast. And once again, I'm Randall Foster, Chief Creative Officer at Symphonic. And Andrea, it's just been a pleasure to have you. Is there anything, uh, websites, anywhere people should go look for for the future? Yeah. Learn W.TeachangeUS and look for our Insta handle at TeachangeUS, one word. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And everyone, thank you for tuning in and stay tuned for the next podcast coming up soon to a podcast player near you.